Well, good morning, Indian Rocks. Uh, my name's Daniel. Uh, the kids over here know me as Pastor D, and I get to serve as one of your pastors. I, I did not prompt that. I did not tell them to do that. Guys, I love you guys. And uh, I typically get to teach the Bible to our middle school students on Sunday mornings. And Pastor Aaron invited me to teach the Bible here today with you. And so uh, there's no other uh, person I would rather be serving with at a church than Pastor Aaron Philippone. Uh, as he said earlier, we are very good friends. He discipled me. I was in his youth group. And so I'm really blessed to get to serve with him here at Indian Rocks. And uh, I'm also thrilled to be preaching to you on Father's Day. It's a day of great celebration in my household. Uh, I have a picture of two of my daughters, uh, Haven Hope. She's the dark-haired girl. She's eight months old, and Willow Kate is three years old. And uh, the greatest joy of my life is getting to parent these two girls with my wife, Mary Madison. Uh, it's it's an awesome day that we get to celebrate. Uh, also, uh, came from a great uh, household who is led by my dad. His name is Jimmy. He is an awesome dad. He's a great granddad. Means the world to me. And uh, you'll get to meet him in a couple months. He's going to be preaching here in a couple months. So you'll see why I think he's so great. And uh, he, he uh, means a lot to me. The reason why is because growing up, he instilled in me and my brothers and my sisters uh, some different things. He taught us all about God's design and what God's design is for our lives. Uh, the three circles is right over here, and uh, we like to teach this as a gospel teaching tool. But my dad always taught us about God's design, what God's design was for young men, what's God's design for fatherhood and for parenting. And he taught us that men are supposed to grow up, and they're supposed to be bold and courageous and strong, and they're supposed to be protectors. And that's what my dad raised us up to do. And so now I get to use everything that he taught me to parent my two daughters and to be a protector and provider for uh, my family. And so I'm really grateful uh, to have the dad that I do. Uh, like I said, he raised us to be protectors. And uh, I had a few little scuffles that I got to get into with my brothers uh, growing up where we got to practice our protector skills. And uh, one day I remember my little brother came home and I think we actually have a picture of my brother's on the screen, but that, that's a bunch you don't want to get in a fight with. Am I right? Uh, those are my brothers. Those are my brother's wedding, James, Jeremiah, Isaac, Stephen, and Caleb. And uh, but our, we stood up for each other. My dad teaches us uh, to stand up for each other. He always taught us that Scroggins boys don't start fights, but we do finish them. And so that's something that my dad always taught us. I remember one time my little brother came home and he was crying. He was upset and he looked like his pride had been hurt. And I said, oh, buddy, what's wrong? What happened? He said, there was a neighborhood bully and he pushed me off my bike and said some really mean things to me and he made me scared. And I said, well, buddy, we're gonna have to go take care of this. And we went around the neighborhood looking for this neighborhood bully. We looked under every rock and behind every bush and all of a sudden we see the neighborhood bully rolling down on his bike down the street. And he wasn't scared because this guy was huge. Okay, he was in 10th grade and I was in 7th grade, but my dad taught us to fight our battles and to be strong and to be courageous. And so I stood up to that bully and I said, bully, did you bully my little brother? And he said, yeah, I did. What are you going to do about it? I said, how about this? Kaboom! And nailed him right in the nose and it stunned him. He couldn't believe that I did that. And so I, I took every chance that I got. And I put him in a headlock and I kept wailing on him. And... <laughs> Uh, eventually, my older brother stepped in and said, D, you're going to go to jail or something. Back off of the guy. And so I did. I backed off of him. But let's, let me tell you, the neighborhood bully never bullied my brother ever again. All right? And that's what happened. And so I tell this story, this funny story, uh, about God's design for young men. Uh, but God doesn't just have a design for young men, or he doesn't just have a design for fathers. He has a, a design for everybody in the room. If you're listening in here today or online, if you are breathing, God has a design, a plan, a purpose for your life. And so I want us to look in God's word today and figure out what that might be. What is your purpose? We know that the local church, our church, is also created with a design. We've been studying the book of Acts over the past several weeks, and it's all about the purpose of the local church. Why do we do church? 
Uh, well, we know that the Bible teaches us to make disciples, to baptize, to teach everything that God has commanded us to do in his scriptures. That's what we're supposed to do as a church. There's a few ways that Indian Rocks fulfills the design that God has set for us. Uh, we have some core values that we teach here. The first core value that we do is we teach the Bible. If you come in here on Sundays, you're going to hear God's word. We're going to study the scriptures. If you go to a life group right now, they're studying God's word. If you go to the kids' building where Miss Kim and her team are at, they're teaching God's word. If you go to student ministry, we're teaching God's word. We teach the Bible at Indian Rocks. Number two is we strive to build families. Uh, family ministry, student ministry, kids' ministry, parent ministry, it's all really, really important. Uh, here at Indian Rocks, we strive to build families, and we also love our neighbors, which is what we're going to talk about today. So we teach the Bible, we build families, we love our neighbors. How do we love our neighbors? Well, we share the gospel with our neighbors. We show compassion to them by sharing the love of Jesus Christ. So we teach the Bible, we build families, we love our neighbors. That's the way that our church lives out God's design. We've been in a series called Church on the Move, and our church is on the move, isn't it? There's uh, things happening all over the place. We just saw those two girls get baptized. There was another girl, Caitlin. She's in the room. She came up before the service and told me that she's going to get baptized at the beach next month. Uh, there's people getting saved. There's marriages being restored. The, God is on the move here at Indian Rocks, just like he was in the early church. The church is on the move because God is on the move. Last week, uh, Pastor Aaron taught us from Acts chapter 14 that churches on the move, never quit. We don't quit. Uh, the first point was that uh, churches on the move never quit because they persevere in the face of persecution. We learned about the apostles and some of the disciples who were stoned, and one of them ended up dying, and they fled, but they didn't quit. Uh, because they were being persecuted, they didn't throw in the towel it actually fueled their fire, and they say, we ain't stopping because people are coming after us. We're going to keep going, and we're going to live for Jesus. Churches on the move persevere in the face of persecution. They also encourage believers to remain faithful. Churches strengthened disciples, and they encourage believers to remain true to the faith no matter what's happening. Churches on the move encourage believers to remain faithful. They also choose leaders to serve the church. Pastor Aaron talked about how uh, the early church appointed leaders in the church they did so with prayer and with fasting, and we need to strive to do the same. And then also, churches on the move celebrate when God opens doors. And the early church, they, when something happened, when someone got saved, someone got healed, they ran all throughout the streets and told everybody all about it. We need to do the same thing. And God is on the move at church, at our church at Indian Rocks, and we need to be sharing it with everybody. We need to be telling everybody, our friends and our neighbors, the reason why we tell them is not because of us, but because of the gospel. It's because of the gospel that everyone needs. Our city and our county is broken, isn't it? It's a broken county, and we have the only thing to fix it, and that's Jesus Christ. Churches on the move celebrate when God opens doors. If you've ever wondered how to recognize and respond to the opportunities that God places in front of you, uh, then this message is for you. Uh, we're going to look today about how God has opened doors in our church in the past and how he's opening doors in the future. Uh, you see, God has a history of opening doors for us here at Indian Rocks. Uh, years ago, Pastor Charlie uh, felt God uh, leading him to move our church uh, right here at this campus on Olmerton Road. And uh, God opened the door. Pastor Charlie led our church to say yes, and they built this amazing campus. And thousands and thousands of people have come to know Jesus and have been discipled here at this campus because of the faithfulness of our church. And then Pastor Jeff was our pastor for about 16 years, and he faithfully taught God's word, and he was a great pastor. And uh, at the end of his time, uh, God opened the door for him to invest in our uh, kids' space. And they built a new kids' building. And the kids' building is unbelievable. If you've never been over there, you can go check it out. Uh, the kids' building is really, really cool. There's hundreds of kids over there right now learning about Jesus because of our church's faithfulness in investing in the next generation. And then now we get to be led by Pastor Aaron, who's an incredible leader. Uh, he has an amazing vision of starting neighborhood churches all across Pinellas County because uh, there's 900,000 people in our county who don't know Jesus. 
900,000. And this room is huge. It's a really big room, but 900,000 people aren't fitting in here. And so we got to go to where those people are at. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, so why should you be listening today? It's because just as God has opened doors for our church, he's opening doors for you. He's opening doors for me. Today we're going to study Acts 15, starting in verse 1, and we're going to explore the doors that God may be calling us to walk through. Doors he's calling our church to walk through. Whether it's in your personal life, your career, or your spiritual journey, understanding how to recognize and respond to these opportunities can transform your life. So let's open up God's Word, open up our Bibles, turn them on to Acts chapter 15, and let's look at what God has planned for us, starting in verse 1. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some others appointed were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversation, the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? By placing a yoke around the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God had first visited the Gentiles to take them from a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agreed, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses had in every city those who proclaim him. For he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. It's a big chunk of scripture, and we're going to break down exactly uh, what it means and how we can apply it to our lives. This passage recounts the Jerusalem Council, which is a significant moment in the early church where the apostles and the elders came together to decide the future of theology of the church. They came together to discuss a critical issue Should the Gentile believers be required to follow the Mosaic law? Should they require to, be, to do extra things to be saved other than faith? This, deba this debate highlights the central message of the gospel and its reach to all people regardless of their background. And as we explore this text, we'll discover two essential truths. Number one, everyone in this room needs the gospel. And number two, we are called to respond to God's invitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, your scripture that we get to study. Lord, thank you for everyone who came in here today to study your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in the room, that you would speak through me, that you would open hearts, and Lord, that we would be fired up to go and take our county uh, for Jesus. Pray that people will be encouraged today by your word. In your name I pray, amen. So my wife and I have different preferences for a lot of things. I don't know how many of you are married or how many of you are in a relationship, but me and my wife are not the same. I love her to death, 
I would die for my wife. But we have differences of opinions. Uh, for instance, I am a huge Kentucky Wildcats fan. I love the Kentucky Wildcats. Now raise your hand if you are a Kentucky Wildcat fan. All right, more than the first service. That's good. All right, my wife loves the Florida Gators. There's obviously a lot more of you. We are outnumbered, but we've beaten you four years in a row in football, so eat that. All right. My wife loves the Florida Gators. I love Kentucky Wildcats. I like eating processed foods. I like going to McDonald's. My wife likes eating organic and all the healthy stuff. I like watching TV. My wife likes working out in the garden. All right. As you can tell from these choices, she's going to live way longer than I am. Uh, but we have differences of opinions, different preferences. Uh, one of the biggest debates we've been having recently is over what type of water is the best, purified or spring water. All right, so I want to pull the room and just ask you, raise your hand if you think purified is the better water. You guys are my people. All right, raise your hand if you think spring water is the better water. Golly, I just think that stuff is disgusting. It tastes like rotten eggs, all right? Now, how, there's a different type of people. That, raise your hand if you just like drinking straight from the hose in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's how I grew up and actually let my daughter do that the other day just so she could have a taste of my childhood. But uh, we debate about this. That's why right now I have a thing of purified water. I think it's far superior, uh, but we can have our differences of opinion. Uh, but uh, this is... Uh, you know, a silly debate. We have fun. It's a lighthearted debate. But the debate that they were having in the 15th chapter of Acts was not a lighthearted, fun debate. This was not a debate about whether LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan that we have at the lunch table. This was not a debate over whether a hot dog is a sandwich or a sub. All right? This is not one of those silly debates. This was a serious debate that had real spiritual implications. So let's read again in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, about what uh, they were debating about. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. So who were these brothers? These brothers were the Christians in the church in Antioch. Uh, that's why we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. If you ever wondered, if you're new to the church world, you're why are these people calling each other brothers and sisters? That's weird. All right, It is kind of weird, but it comes from the Bible. And uh, if you are a believer in Jesus and you are a boy, then you're my brother. If you're a girl, you're my sister. It comes straight from uh, this chapter in Acts. So these people, uh, these brothers were people who had accepted Jesus and who were part of the early church community. The term brother shows the close bond among followers of Jesus. In verse 2 it says, And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this. Now, this was a huge debate. This outcome would determine whether Christianity would be a works-based faith or not. Setting the direction of the church's theology for the future. Because of this, Paul and Barnabas, along with others, were appointed to go to Jerusalem and to meet with other brothers and sisters and talk about uh, which direction are we going to go. Are we going to be a works-based faith or are we going to be a faith-based faith? Which direction are we going to go? In verse 3, we see that Paul and Barnabas traveled to Jerusalem. And along the way, they shared the exciting news about the Gentiles being saved and the cities that they were at and the churches they celebrated and they cheered. However, when they arrived in Jerusalem, not everybody was thrilled. Verse 5 tells us that Jewish Christians, especially those who used to be Pharisees, believed that Gentile converts still needed to be circumcised and follow some other rules to be saved. This meant that uh, they needed a works-based faith. So they all came together and they discussed and they debated the issue. And out of a, after a lot of discussion, Peter stood up and addressed the group in verse 7 to bring clarity to the situation. Verse 7 says, And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by 
faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing the yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But if we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Peter stood up and he said that God chose him to share the gospel with the Gentiles and he decided to set the room straight. That salvation comes through grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Uh, there's no works-based faith uh, in Christianity. Peter said, this debate is done. This is what God has decided. This is the direction that we are going to go. And now what do I mean by works-based faith? The Jewish leaders were teaching uh, that the Gentiles had to do extra things to be saved. They said that just believing in the gospel wasn't enough. Just having faith in the Lord wasn't enough. That they had to be circumcised and follow certain dietary rules to get to heaven. Uh, some people... And today's world might think that if you're just nice enough, you're a nice enough person, you're a good enough person, you don't commit any major crimes, that's good enough to get into heaven. We know that that's not true. Some people think that if you say this many Hail Marys and uh, confess this many sins, that that'll get you to heaven. And we know that that's not the case when you read the scriptures. Uh, the only way that you can get saved is by believing in the gospel. And that leads us to our first point, that everyone needs the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, and that God raised him on the third day. The Jews needed the gospel. That's why Christ died on the cross for their sins. Throughout history, the Jews tried to follow God's law and tried to follow all the rules, and they just couldn't quite ever do it because it's impossible. And so Jesus came down to earth, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for them. The Gentiles needed the gospel too. In verse 12, it says that the assembly fell silent as they listened to Paul and Barnabas talk about the amazing things that God had done among the Gentiles. This shows that the Gentiles were really, really far from God. All right, they weren't even close. We have some people that we know they're kind of Christianists. They don't really... Uh, believe in Jesus, but they're kind of good people. This is, these were not the Gentiles. The Gentiles were far from God. They weren't even trying to fake it. That's why the assembly fell silent. They were on the edge of their seats. You could hear a pin drop in the room. They were amazed at the things that they were hearing about how the Gentiles were being saved. They needed an intervention, and God worked miracles through uh, Paul and Barnabas. The miracles that God worked were faith Miracles. The Gentiles simply repented of their sins and believed in the gospel. The Jews needed the gospel. The Gentiles needed the gospel. You and I, we need the gospel. Uh, this is the three circles. It's a tool that we use to illustrate uh, the gospel. And we already talked about God's design, how God has a plan and a design for all of us. Uh, when you were born, God created you uniquely. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and he made you with a design and with a purpose. Uh, the problem is that we sin. We depart from God's design. We do things that God tells us not to do. We do things that are apart from God's design, and it's not good. And usually when we do that, it leads us to a place of brokenness. And brokenness is not a good place. Some of you have been in brokenness in the past. Some of you are in brokenness right now. And you know what that feels like. It's not good. Uh, maybe it causes anger or anxiety, depression. It puts you in a place that you don't want to be in. And we try all of these ways to get out of brokenness that are apart from Jesus, and it just doesn't work. Uh, some of the Jewish leaders were teaching them that you would have to do all these different things. You would have to be circumcised to get out of brokenness. That you would have to file certain, follow certain dietary rules to get out of brokenness. Some people think that if you're just a good enough person, that it'll get you out of brokenness. If you just have this much amount of money, it'll get you out of brokenness. The problem is, some of you in the room have a lot of money. And you know that money doesn't cure your brokenness. Some of us try relationships. If I can just get with that girl or that boy, it'll make me happy. If we can just have a, uh, this many kids, it'll make me happy. If I can just have that job, it'll make me happy and it'll get me out of brokenness. And while... All these things may be good things. Uh, it's not going to get you out of brokenness. The only way that you can get out of brokenness is by repenting of your sins, to stop living for yourself and to live for Jesus. Uh, 
to believe in the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. That's the only way we can get out of brokenness. There's someone that I wish that I could share the gospel with. I have a picture of him. He's familiar to most of you. His name is Elon Musk. And Elon Musk has accomplished a lot of really uh, amazing things. Uh, he's done a lot of really cool things for our society. I have a list of things that I want to read you. First of all, he's the richest man in the world as of last night. He's worth $200 billion. It's unbelievable. Uh, he runs Tesla. The reason he runs Tesla, he focuses on electric vehicles, energy storage, and solar products. He leads their product design, engineering, and manufacturing efforts at Tesla because he wants to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. He also runs SpaceX, which designs, manufactures, and launches advanced rockets like what's in the picture. Under his leadership, SpaceX has made significant strides in space exploration, and they plan to colonize Mars. In 2016, he helped start a company called Neuralink, which is basically puts a chip in your brain, and it helps people with neurological conditions, and he wants to enhance human capabilities. In 2017, he found the Boring Company. Uh, that name's taken, in case you want to name your company, Boring, which focuses on creating a tunnel infrastructure to reduce urban traffic congestion. Can I get an Amen. Nobody likes traffic. He wants to help solve that problem. In 2022, he acquired X, formerly known as Twitter. He wants to promote free speech. And most recently, he launched a company called XAI, which is an art, art, artificial intelligence company because he wants to understand the true meaning and nature of the universe, which is really interesting. About a month ago, he spoke at a conference, and he said, the reason why I'm doing all these things, I'm starting all these initiatives, I'm running all these companies, is because I know there's something more to life. I know that there's something else out there, and I don't know what it is, and I think that all of these things might help me find that. That's not the first time that Elon Musk has uh, said that before. He said it uh, all throughout the years. Uh, that's why he's trying to find the true meaning of life. And I can't tell him, I couldn't bust through my iPad screen and tell him the true meaning. I couldn't tell him that he's in brokenness because he needs Jesus, but I can tell you today, we need Jesus. We need to say yes to Jesus. All of those things, even though they may be good things, will not get us out of brokenness. The only thing that'll get us out of brokenness is Jesus. We need to repent of our sins and believe in the gospel that Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and that God raised him on the third day. We have to have a sense of urgency also to share uh, that message. Some of you are Christians, you're like, dude, I've already given my life to Jesus, what do I need to do? You need to share that message. We've got to spread it all throughout our county. We need to spread it through our families. We need to share it with our kids. We have to share the gospel message because that's the only way that's gonna cure brokenness. Point number one, everyone needs the gospel. And number two, the gospel is available to everyone. James, who is a leader in the church, stood up to speak in verse 13. And he agrees with Peter that God has shown that the Gentiles can be Christians without following all the Jewish laws. And James quotes the prophet Amos showing that it was always a part of God's plan to include everyone. The gospel isn't just for the Jewish people, it's for everybody. It's for the Gentiles. It's for you. He suggests that we should not make it hard for people to turn to God by making them follow unnecessary rules. James was saying that if the church is serious about reaching people, then they're going to have to get uncomfortable. He's saying that if they're serious about reaching people far from God, then they're going to have to do uh, some uncomfortable things. They're going to have to get out of their comfort zones. They'll have to get used to having people in their churches who look different and who act different and who maybe don't know how to behave like Christians are supposed to behave. James is telling them that we need to be accepting of everyone who is lost and who is broken because God is accepting. And that doesn't mean that leaving people the way that they are we need to let them do whatever they want, right? But it means that we need to welcome them in and we need to disciple them. What does that mean for Indian Rocks? 
Well, if we're going to be serious about reaching those people far from Christ, are we ready for what that means? Are we ready to accept people who are messed up in their marriages and who have wacky family situations? Are we ready to accept them and to wrap our arms around them and help disciple them to Jesus? Are we ready to accept people who stink coming off the streets? Are we ready to wrap our arms around them and to help them live for Jesus? Are we ready to accept people who dress differently and who act differently? Are we ready to accept the people who just sat in your seat this morning? The new people, and they sat in your seat, and you're not happy about it. And I understand that, but are we ready to wrap our arms around those people and accept them? Are we ready to accept people that are in deep, deep brokenness? The gospel is for everyone. It's for Jews. It's for Gentiles. It's for men. It's for women. It's for boys. It's for girls. It's for every race, it's for every neighborhood, it's for every language, it's for every place, it's for everyone around us in our daily lives, and we have to share the gospel message. That's why Pastor Juan right now is leading Indian Rocks in Espanol, and there's about 200 people who speak language, who speak Spanish as their first language, and they're getting discipled in Indian Rocks in Espanol because the gospel is for every language. That's why in the next couple of years, we're going to be launching our new neighborhood church in Pinellas Park. And some of you have been praying about that, and you're going to go, and you're going to help start that church. Some of you have not been praying about it, and you don't want to do it, but God's going to end. He has funny ways to get you there, and he'll, he's going to work in your life in that way. But that's why we're doing that. It's because our county needs Jesus, and we're going to take it to him. Uh, we can't stop there. We can't just stop in Pinellas Park. We can't just stop in Indian Rocks and Espanol. We need to keep sharing the gospel and inviting people into our homes and into our church and move forward with the mission of God. Church, the gospel is for everyone. It's available to everyone. And God wants us to say yes to the gospel. This is a call to put your yes on the table. When we were at student camp a few weeks ago, uh, we had an amazing time, and the best part about camp is that kids make spiritual decisions. And at the end of every sermon, we challenge them to put their yes on the table. Two girls just got baptized today, decided to put their yes on the table for Jesus. Uh, I want to read a few stats to you that are pretty cool that came from camp about students who put their yes on the table. One night, Pastor Aaron had all the students stand up who gave their life to Jesus for the first time. And six kids rose to their feet and said that they put their faith and trust in Jesus. They put their yes on the table. 31 students said that they have put their faith and trust in Jesus before, but they've never made it public. They've never really told anyone. And they stood up and said they're ready to put their yes on the table. They're ready to make their faith public. And they're going to get baptized here at Indian Rocks. 31 students. 14 students put their yes on the table and they came up to us and they said that they decided to step up and they want to serve in the church. They're tired of sitting on the sidelines and they want to serve. They want to be greeters. They want to help in our kids' ministry. They want to uh, learn how to serve the church and we're going to help them do it. Uh, one of the coolest ones is that 12 kids stood up and said that they felt called to full-time ministry or some form of church work. And they want our church to help put our arms around them and to disciple them and to train them how to do that. Similarly, God wants you to say yes to the gospel. Uh, for each of us, this will look different. For some of us, it may be getting more involved in the church. You come to church every once in a while, but it's not the main priority in your life. God's not number one. For some of you, it's putting God number one in your life. You're a Christian, you're a believer, but you need to make church you need to make Jesus number one in your life and a priority for your family. For others, it means getting baptized. Just like the 31 students decided to get baptized, God's calling you to get baptized. You're a believer in Jesus, but you've never shown it publicly. God wants you to say yes, put your yes on the table, and to get baptized. Uh, perhaps uh, you've done both of those things, uh, but you've been sitting on the sideline. You need to get involved. You need to be encouraged. You need to be held accountable, and you need to join a life group. Maybe it's jumping in a life group and jumping in biblical community. Maybe that's your yes. Maybe some of you are just awesome leaders. You're business people. You know how to lead people really well, uh, but you haven't really stepped up into leadership in the church. Maybe putting your yes on the table is by becoming a life group leader. 
and by leading people spiritually. For some people, being, saying yes might be going on the mission field. You might feel uh, that God is calling you to share the gospel overseas. This past week at the Southern Baptist Convention, a few of us went and we got to see 81 people who put their yes on the table for Jesus be commissioned to go overseas and to share uh, the gospel with people who've never heard it before. Some of them to very dangerous places. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your yes. Uh, some of you might be called to join the launch team for Pinellas Park. Maybe that's your yes. Maybe God wants you to join the mission and to be on the setup and tear down team and to go reach people for Jesus over in Pinellas Park. Maybe that's your yes. For some, it's simply saying yes to Jesus for the first time. There's some people in here who are broken. They've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They've heard the spiels, they've heard the speeches, but their hearts have been hard and they've never accepted Jesus Christ. They're in brokenness. Maybe your yes is finally releasing yourself from that brokenness by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, by repenting of your sins and believing in the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried and that God raised him on the third day. I don't know what God has in store for you, but I think it's time that we say yes to what he's calling us to do. So church, everyone needs the gospel. Every person, regardless of their background, everyone needs the gospel. The gospel is available to everyone. We must share the gospel with those around us and make it more accessible uh, to people. The gospel is available to everyone. And number three, we need to say yes to the gospel. Whether it's getting involved in our church, whether it's serving, whether it's going to the mission field, starting the Pinellas Park campus, or saying yes to Jesus for the very first time, God is calling us to put our yes on the table. God has something incredible in store for our church, and he wants you to be a part of it. Let's put our yes on the table. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to gather today to worship you. Lord, thank you for giving us opportunities to worship at a place like Indian Rocks where we can uh, learn from the, the Bible, from God's word, where we can serve, where we can encourage one another. Lord, I pray for everyone here today that they would put their yes on the table. Now, God, that looks differently for everybody. It looks differently for me than it does uh, my brother sitting uh, right in front of me. But Lord, I pray that you would allow us to continue to put our yes on the table, Lord, because ultimately we want your glory to be shown in our community and we want people to accept you. Lord, please help us continue to reach people for your kingdom. In your name I pray, amen.